Hi, everyone. This is Lina Gonzalez Granados. And I'm Kensha Watanabe, and we are the Conductors Collective. For our second episode on the TDO Network with Conductors Collective, we're really lucky to present the music director of the Dallas Opera, Emmanuel Viom. Maestro, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Yes. Thank you for, for coming to this week's episode. Uh, we started our first um, installments of this, talking a little bit about our lives and our upbringing. It hasn't been too long since we met you and me. And um, it has been a, an incredible ride to get to know you. But I'm curious actually um, to know a little bit of how did you get into conductor and like tell us briefly about your upbringing. I was um, eight years old, nine years old. We were, I was in the children chorus at the cathedral in Strasbourg, but we were, we were also singing for the opera. So we, won the, we were the children chorus for the opera. The first time I arrived on stage, it was Turando of Puccini. And I just, I just had like thunder go through my old soul and body. And I knew I belonged there. I knew my life was starting to make sense now. I knew all the emotions that I had in me that were repressed. They were not only here possible, but people were trying to express them. There was a value in expressing them. And I saw the little guy in the pit and I just say, oh, but he's moving all of this. He's cooking all of this. And that was very interesting to me. So, for me, music and conducting and singing have always been very, very, very connected. So I have a training, I have my diplomas in musicology, for instance. I have a certain, uh, I, I like to tease that I have a strong disdain for musicology because it's a discipline that doesn't exist, you know? Of course, I say this as a musicologist myself. I think it should be part <laughs> of philosophy of aesthetic or it should be part of music study or history of art. But musicology in itself as a discipline has to you know, tap in all those various disciplines. Um, and I, teaching didn't interest, didn't interest me, making research didn't interest me. I came back to that young kid and the feelings he had for music. And I went back to Strasbourg and in the same theater where I was a kid and had this kind of uh, uh, coup de foudre and revelation uh, as uh, my, the, the way music made sense for me. Um, and I uh, applied and I, they took me as assistant director um, and dramaturge. I would write a little, you know, articles uh, for the programs and that kind of things. And I met a conductor uh, who was a great conductor who came there, who a student of Nadia Boulanger, whose name is Spiros Argyris, who's a, a fantastic conductor. And uh, I told Spirits, you know, this is interesting because now I'm more in this uh, 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 intellectual part of our industry, but I, I, I wanted to be a conductor. And he said, well, okay, let me see, can you hear? Yeah, oh yeah, you can hear. Uh, what do you think of uh, the rehearsal? So on, and so on, and so on. I can take you as my, as my assistant. And I, okay, what I didn't know is that he was saying this to anybody who was coming by, you know, in the time. And he was the music director of Spoleto in Italy. The Spoleto Festival, which was created by uh, Giancarlo Menotti uh, and uh, Sam Barber and with Visconti and so on, very prestigious festival that uh, was then uh, associated with a new festival he created in the US, which is the Spoleto Festival USA, created a few years later. And then it was the Festival de Due Mondi, Festival of the Two Worlds. And Spiros took me to the festival and the first year was Parsifal and he took, took me as an assistant wow. and there were other assistants and I had to conduct a few rehearsals and I was conducting the backstage. And at that point, I had a very, very, very uh, a faint training in uh, conducting itself, uh, which I had started to do knowing I was going to assist him with a, a great conductor in, um, in Strasbourg, who was then teaching at a conservatory, I, get, I got some private lessons there. And at the, at the end of that year in, in, in uh, Spoleto, Spiros told me, well, okay, you really need to learn to conduct, but I find you have something interesting. Uh, I like you very much as my assistant. Um, I think you have something, I can help you for that. 
was maybe 20, 23, 20, yeah, 22, 23 by the time. I really worked then the whole year as I was still at the Strasbourg Opera, the Opera National du Rhin. And um, I worked with uh, this uh, conductor, Claude Schnitzler. And uh, I went back the next year, whereas I was assistant, I think it was Yenufa. So I worked on Yenufa. I did some of the stage uh, rehearsals. Um, and toward the end of the festival, Spiros was doing on the Grand Piazza. So it's a big square of Spoleto, beautiful place, you know, on a slope that uh, at the end you have the, this beautiful dorm or the cathedral. And it's, uh, it, in the time, it was a very important concert in Italy because it was televised. Uh, it was the beginning of the, 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 the vacation for people. And uh, it's amplified. It's a 10,000 uh, people uh, square. And uh, Spiro said, well, you know, I want to hear a little. So tomorrow, why don't you conduct some of uh, the Mother Free and I can hear from the, 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 the square. I'd never touched an orchestra by then. Wow. <laughs> so I said, yes, of course, I didn't know better. You know, of course, yes, 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 yes. I'm your assistant, I'm going to do that. So I went on the podium and I started somewhere in the middle of the first movement. And I was like, I think I told Lina the story, I was like a vampire that tastes blood for the first time, although he's already a teenager or something like that. Oh my God. And I got so much into the music. I got so excited. I didn't know better. So in a way I was able to put it together. Um, and um, because I, I was not always thinking things, I was just going. And um, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, go to the next movement and so on. So they had to grab me out of the podium because I didn't want to give away my seat. So one of the things that we like to talk about a lot at Conductors Collective is about some of the ingredients of leadership, especially collaboration and communication. So in an amazing art form such as opera, where there's so many different moving parts and you have leaders of different areas in charge, how do you envision your role as a music director or a conductor with respect to especially your collaboration with stage directors? Yeah, so I... <laughs> I'm a man of theater, I studied theater. And for me, my love of opera has always been connected to uh, the dramatic aspect. Uh, so I love to work with stage directors. Um, and I would say I love to work with stage directors who are interested in opera, but who are not necessarily coming from an opera background. So, uh, uh, which is, complicated because sometimes, you know, I worked with very famous movie directors who came to the opera and they were so intimidated by the genre, so much in love with the genre of opera that they started being too respectful and not challenging things enough. And in the end, they might, if someone is not helping them, they might end up doing something that is even more traditional than the traditional. <laughs> and, and that has happened to me many times. So I worked, you know, I worked with Werner Herzog. I was actually assistant with Werner. And, and I mean, Werner Herzog is someone who loves opera. You know, if you, if you, you have to see the movie Fitzcarraldo, for instance, the story of this crazy guy with a boat in the Amazon and who wants to, to have an opera house in the middle of the Amazon and so on. Um, and Werner was, had so many ideas and so on, but sometimes he wouldn't dare to go far enough. And, and we, we really encouraged him to go very far. And, and that was then in the end, that was, that was, I think, more productive and more interesting. I worked with Gary Marshall, the guy who, who did a Pretty Woman, we did uh, La Grande Duchesse of uh, Gerolstein. And uh, that was, absolutely, absolutely amazing because Gary um, understood the genre very well, you know, and, and but at first it was like, how, how do I do this? Okay, they have to be in the front, right? They can move there. I said, just do whatever you want. Do whatever comes to your brain. Do it as, a, as, as one of your comic, I didn't, didn't want to say stupid, TV shows, you know, 
And let's see how it works with this. So all of this to say, I like directors who have a point of view and who have a very strong point of view, even if that point of view is not exactly the literal point of view of the libretto or the music. Because in that space, in that difference between the literal uh, dramatic indications of the score or situation of the score and what the director wants to tell about the story, in that difference, my music can work, can go from one to the other. My music can create virtual lines that all of a sudden make everything seen from an angle where you have a little shade or you have a possibility of a development, you have questions, you have opening. What he's not saying with the staging, I can say it with the music. What he's saying that is not in the situation, I can comment it with the music. I can rectify it with the music. I can make it go deeper in the piece. As we know, in opera, you have so many lines. You have the dramatic situation, you have the words, the, 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 the libretto, you have the vocal line, you have the orchestration. All of those things, they don't say exactly the same thing. They all work parallelly and they contradict themselves, they work with themselves, they comment on themselves, but commenting is not a, a, a repetition. And then you have the staging itself, which is another uh, 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 line, semantic, semiologic line. Um, so that line for me, that dramatic line is super important because that forces me to reorganize everything else I'm doing. And it mm. forces me to think about it. If I come up with a stage director that has no imagination and who is super literal and who is just trying to reproduce what is already there in the score, the score mm -hmm. doesn't shine. The score is not strong enough. So that's what I expect from a stage director is a strong point of view. That's usually what I like in a stage director. Some conductors prefer a stage director that's going to be not in their way because that's what they feel about the piece and they want to make sure that the singers are, you know, um, not too far. So it's easier to put together. I'm not interested in rehearsal in those things. And even if I have my doubt that the scene is going to work because one of the partner is at the end of the stage hanging uh, from the ceiling on his feet naked, I say, let's try it. Let's go through this, let's go through that scene and let's see where we go with it. And then if the stage director is in smart, you know, he's going to say, well, actually it doesn't work. So let's, let's do something else. So I do expect a very strong dramatic point of view. And usually um, people who have a strong dramatic point of view, they also get the music. So they have an ear for the music themselves. And I think the best combination is a stage director that has a strong point of view that is not too literal, but that still understands the score understands how the score is functioning and knows when he's departing from that. And when you have a conductor that is interested in the drama, then they meet somewhere. But that meeting is a meeting from different angles and is a dialectical one that has, you know, maybe discussion, uh, even tension, and then resolution. That's how it is interesting to me. So, Part of our audience, eh, Maestro, are conductors who are just starting out on this journey and diving into repertoire and falling in love with the art form. Um, what would you say are the um, really specific skills you think a conductor in opera should have? Like the initial, at least. A conductor in general? Uh, because uh, did you say operatic conductor or conductor? Yeah. Like if I want to, if I want to. So I have, I have first to say, I don't believe you are an operatic conductor. No, it's both. Yeah. You need absolutely to do both. You know, I mean, yeah. if, if here, if I go in a concert hall, I can hear someone conducting a Mahler symphony who has no experience of opera. I hear it right away. And if I hear the Rosen Cavalier, I can hear if the conductor 
has a huge experience in Mozart or Mahler and, and, and Beethoven. You, you just, that is the same job. And if you do only half of it, you're not doing your job. I really believe in this. Um, and, and we can talk in details about this. Um, the amount of things you should know to be a conductor is immense. I mean, you need to have notion of bowings. You really need to. I, I play the cello a little, but I don't like to give bowings to my orchestra because usually they know better than I do. I rather talk about phrasing, but you cannot talk about phrasing without knowing a minimum of bowing, you know? So you, you should understand, you know, the pedaling of the harp. Well, you need to be aware that at least the harp has some pedaling issues. And so when you go back to number 10, you know, <laughs> she needs to do, or he needs to do, to do all of those things. I think the most important technical aspect is, is really score analysis, understanding how to question a score, understanding how a score is built and constructed. So, you know, if it is harmony, if it is um, form analysis, you need to have that kind of tools in order to question the score. And everybody is going to be different. I had an assistant who could not conduct the score without having analyzed each single chord and put the, the, the chiffrage on the knees. That drives me nuts. That's not the way I do it. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I understand the parcours. I do my, my periods and so on. But, but you know what? I didn't question it. He said, I just can't do it. I can't come. And he was a pianist by, by training and said, I can't do it if I don't do it. If I, if I don't do that analysis, I cannot conduct. Um, so I would say from a musical point of view, that's, that's really what you need to know. Analysis of score, understanding how to question a score, being in the brain of the composer and see how he has built this. It's not enough to say this is the result. I like to go in the mind of the composer, go from his own seat when he had the musical ideas and how it found its way in the paper finally to this and more than the paper in where is the score? You know, is it in the paper? Is it in the brain of the conductor? Is it in the hole as you perform? You need to in invest that part and have the tools to question this. I think that that is very important. One of the things I think early on when I was getting into opera, one of the scores that really opened my eyes into the craft that is operatic writing was Gianni Schicchi. Mm -hmm. Going through the score and understanding how masterfully Puccini goes from one transition to the next. And I think this is what um, really opened my eyes into kind of, wow, what an art form this is. Do you have some other scores in mind that you would recommend a young conductor to start familiarizing themselves with the style and also the, uh, the art form uh, in this way? I mean, that was one that came to mind when I was thinking about this. Right. Uh, yeah, this is a good score because it, it encapsulates all the, the complexity of opera and how those various uh, lines we were talking about are intertwined and masterfully put in one object, you know. Um, I would say any Mozart opera is a good start. Go to Don Giovanni, go to Nozze di Figaro, and you will see actually how the orchestration is connected to the action and how this is all developing so masterfully. Um, me, the experience you talk about, I had it with Salome. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Where all of a sudden, oh my God, the second clarinet is doing this because this is happening. Oh my God, I didn't know this could be so detailed and so sought through in every single aspect of every single of these lines on the page and in the end have a, such an impact. And this so strong object is coming from so many different parts that are together. So, Salome was personally one of those revelations. Another piece was Yenufa, but that's just because I happen to, the, the way the drama is expressed by the music and the way it's working together in Yenufa, it was for me mind boggling, you know? And then you have sometimes forms that are abstract forms that are developing themselves from a pure music writing point of view, you know? So I thought that was interesting. Um, 
any Puccini score. Yeah. I think if you have a heart, if you're a musician and you want to understand what opera is, I, I would go to, to Bohème or Butterfly even before I go to Janice Kiki, you know? I mean, Janice Kiki is, is, is fun. It's extremely sophisticated. Um, Mine was Tosca. Yes, of course. Mine was uh, Tosca, La Traviata. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, but you go, listen, um, uh, it's just sorry I've, I've told, so it's sorry if I repeat myself, but Bruno Walter went to Mahler and said, you know, I want to learn orchestration. And, and uh, Mahler, who was a master orchestrator, but always claimed he could not orchestrate and had to constantly reorchestrate, um, told him, listen, I don't have the time, I cannot teach you anything. Um, but take the score of Carmen and write it from end to finish. Rewrite it. You will know everything you need to know about orchestration, which is quite fascinating because when we think of Carmen, it's, it's kind of easy and so on and so on and so on. But that was coming from Mahler, the genius of Bizet in this writing you know, is, is a lesson in what you can do. So um, those, those masterpieces are good entry to this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend necessarily a Wagner piece, for instance, because this is, this, you, you won't get the same kind of, but no, take Meister Singer, you know, it, which again, a, a, a lighter piece, the way all the circulation of meanings is extraordinary. Take the piece you like, and then analyze it and you will see how it works. I, I think that's the best advice. Take the one you like and it will be, you know, if you like it, it's a good piece. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Emmanuel, for joining us here and I hope to see you on the webinars of the Conductors Collective and, and on another time, absolutely. Yes, so I would love to. Thank you guys.